Good evening, everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is David Crow, and I'm, uh, it's my privilege, actually, to be head of college here at Chelsea College of Arts, um, and to just welcome you here tonight to Chelsea. I, I have the mundane task of saying we have no fire alarm planned this evening as well, so if that goes off, just follow those, those green and white signs out of the building. Um, one of the goals we have here at UEL is to, is to develop a, a world-class research culture that it both sort of informs and inspires our teaching. Um, so tonight's a very important part of that really for us. We, we would hope that events like this will kind of be absorbed by the staff here and will eventually lead to sort of innovation, challenging convention in the studios, nurturing talent in the colleges, and asking interesting and at times really difficult questions. Um, this platform series obviously is a chance to share that, to share our expertise, to open up that discussion with a wider group, um, many of whom are from UEL, but we have six colleges and we don't see you around here often enough, so it's nice to have you around to have that discussion. Um, but we do have people from outside of UEL, other academics, artists, designers, writers, curators, and just interesting members of the public actually. It, it's really useful in highlighting where we have expertise, where we have real expertise here in Chelsea. And, and it also gives us a chance to celebrate the work of, of some of our academics here. Personally, I first came across Malcolm's work some years before I arrived at UAL, actually. I was in another city worrying myself about what art schools were about, um, and I came across one of Malcolm's books. So I was delighted, actually, to arrive here and find that Malcolm was here and, and to have access, direct access to, to somebody who, who's kind of very knowledgeable about these things. I'm still worried about what our schools are about, but I probably always will, but I think that's probably healthy. Um, so it's been a real pleasure actually working alongside him, so very much looking forward to giving the talk tonight. But I'm not going to introduce his lecture. I'm going to give that pleasure to uh, Professor Philip Schofield from UCL, um, who's going to come up and help and introduce Malcolm's lecture. Thank you, Philip. Anyway, it's an immense pleasure and um, a great honour for me to introduce Professor Malcolm Quinn. I've known Malcolm for about 10 years, gosh, is it really 10 years? I've, oh, I should say only 10 years. Um, ever since he had the boldness to attend one of our Bentham seminars at UCL. And he explained to me that he was working on beauty literarianism and art, which um, to many people um, is a contradiction in terms. But um, he subsequently invited me to speak on Bentham and Taste at a symposium which he organised on the idea of the art school in the early 19th century Britain, um, at Tate Britain in 2010. I mean, I think I was too naive, I'm still naive, and certainly too trusted in Malcolm to realise that I'd actually been set up as a sort of agile provocateur. But Malcolm had come to realise that there was an important conversation to be had concerning Benthamite utilitarianism and aesthetics that was not only of historical interest, but of contemporary significance. So I then invited Malcolm to give a Bentham Seminar, having become aware that he was opening up what was, for scholars of Bentham and of the history of utilitarianism more generally, a whole new area of study. And it was saying that actually this consent is hollow, hollow land for Benthamites because Bentham wants all of the land here. And I suspect in a parallel universe we are all in a democratic prison. <laughs> Anyway, Malcolm soon afterwards published his monograph, Utilitarianism and the Art School in 19th Century Britain. And this combines his cross-disciplinary expertise in fine art, intellectual history, and art education. It consists of a highly original study of the influence of utilitarian thought, and of Bentham in particular, on the introduction of publicly funded art education in 19th century Britain. The key events in his account are first, the establishment of the House of Commons Select Committee on Arts and Manufactures of 1835 to six, which was dominated by followers of Bentham, in particular Bentham's literary executor, John Bowring, and by William Ewart, and which led to the establishment of the government-funded School of Design. And second, the reforms introduced by Henry Cole and, um, after the school came under his control in 1852. 
Falcon points out that, this, that Bentham regarded the notion of good taste as a device used by the aristocracy or ruling elite in order to support their power and privileges. Aristocratic good taste found its institutional embodiment in the Royal Academy of Arts. The School of Design, therefore, gave its ben given its Benthamite origins, might have been expected to provide a clear utilitarian alternative to the Royal Academy. Malcolm argues, however, that influenced by the laissez-faire principles associated with Adam Smith, and therefore excluding any role for the legislator, Birmingham and Newark accepted the standards provided by custom and convention in matters of taste. It was only when Cole came to control the school that a more radical agenda was adopted. Questions of taste were subordinated to questions of utility, legislative involvement encouraged and some distance placed between the publicly funded institution and the Royal Academy. Malcolm goes on to argue that Bentham's radical utilitarian agenda for the art school remains relevant today as a model for the publicly funded art school. In short, the book is not only a highly original contribution to Bentham's studies, 19th century intellectual history and the history of art education, but also announces a rationale for a programme of reform. Now, Malcolm has since worked on a comparison of the standards of taste found in Hume and Bentham, and has further developed his ideas about the nature of taste in a democratic society. As well as the explicit comparison of Hume and Bentham, Malcolm has shed considerable light on their respective underlying philosophies and the vexed question as to whether Hume was or was not a utilitarian and whether, or rather to what extent, Bentham was a follower of you. By relating his considerable knowledge and understanding of aesthetics to themes in the history of moral and political theory, Malcolm's making a contribution to the subject that is being recognised internationally to be of outstanding importance and originality. As an example of the way in which Malcolm is playing a crucial role in developing and expanding the range of Bentham studies, I'd like to refer to the current seminar series on Bentham and the Arts that, together with Professor Anthony Julius of UCL Laws, uh, Malcolm and I have organised and which will lead to a co-edited publication. Speakers have been asked to consider Bentham's challenge to aesthetics with a particular focus on Bentham's writings on sexual morality, in which he demolishes the traditional Christian conflation of marriage, sex and procreation. So I'm grateful to Malcolm for his support, advice, encouragement, and especially his ideas, which are making this series so successful. I mention this to show that Malcolm is passionate about his, not only a top-rate scholar, but that he's an excellent colleague, who is passionate about his subject, and who communicates that passion to others. Now, the present lecture, which develops some of the themes that characterise his recent work, and relates them to a contemporary setting, will constitute the evidence that will prove the claims that I have made about the quality of Malcolm's research and scholarship. So I know that we will not be disappointed. And so now I invite Malcolm to give his lecture on taste and democracy. It was on a number of texts and papers that are in the public domain or are about to be published. The first of these is The Persistence of Taste, Art Museums and Everyday Life of de Bourdieu, which I've edited with Dave Beach, Carol Tollock, who is here, Michael Lennart, who is here, and Stephen Wilson, who is here. Stop, don't Dave to miss him. Which, I, uh, which will be published in May this year. I also draw on two articles I've published in the Journal of History of European Ideas, which are up there, um, and my book, as mentioned uh, by David, Utilitarianism and the Art School in 19th Century Britain. This lecture is also informed, as Philip mentioned, by my role as one of the conveners of the Bentham of the Art, the Bentham and the Art series, and that was a recent, very excellent uh, lecture by Stella Sanford, who also lectured here recently, so I'm closing these loops. Um, and um, yeah, so this is something that's ongoing. It's on to the 18th of June, and we'd love it if you all came and saw what we were doing, so please do come. Finally, this lecture draws on a chapter called Guilty Pleasures, Taste, Design and Democracy that I've written for the Blackwell Companion to Contemporary Design since 1945, edited by Anne Massey. 
So those are the sources. And now, I've got to say I was delighted and honoured when University of the Arts of London gave me the title of Professor of Cultural and Political History, not least because this gives me the opportunity to do research at the intersection of culture and politics within the historical framework of state-funded art education on which this university was founded and within which I was educated. My current research is about how Jeremy Bentham's thought can change our view of the familiar story of British aesthetics since the 18th century. This research sustains a focus on aesthetics, ethics and politics that I've maintained since the publication of my first book in 1994. In Utilitarianism in the Art School, I showed how followers of Bentham in the UK Parliament in the 19th, early 19th century, who included Bentham's editor John Bowring, sought to change attitudes to the art to arts institutions when they challenged the public status of the Royal Academy of Arts and secured a grant for the first state funded art school in England, this school, the Government School of Design, uh, established in 1837, the very beginning of the Victorian era. Securing a government grant for art education, which was only the second government grant for any kind of education whatsoever, was a political act. It was part of a general argument about the transparency and accountability of public institutions. I was both pleased and disappointed to see an echo of this recently uh, in complaints that works of art borrowed from the Royal Collection, which are currently on show in an exhibition of the art collection of Charles I at the Royal Academy of Arts. Uh, should be, according to the editorial in one national newspaper, free to be seen by the people, its true owners. So this debate on public uh, space, public ownership, and public transparency, it seems, continues. In this lecture, in line with the focus of my current research, I'm going to place the particular historical narrative of state-funded art, art education in Britain within the larger narrative of the bourgeois revolution in taste leading from Joseph Addison to David Hume, as well as indicating how Jeremy Bentham staged counter-arguments against Hume and Addison in the name of democracy. In placing taste outside democracy, I'll argue, Bentham provided us with an insight into the strange apolitical politics of taste, which seek to bring about a situation in which the route to a certainty of judgment and common understanding is only available through the apolitical agency of impartiality. This position of impartiality, however, <clears throat> is used to enforce the social distinction. <clears throat> and this, if you like, is the motif of the lecture, the social distinction that separates the good and impartial pleasures of refined taste from the bad and indiscriminate pleasures of the world. The motif is going to be recurrent, and it is the pleasures of taste versus the pleasures of the world. Um, this separation was particularly emphasized by David Hume in the middle of the 18th century. Hume tells us that, that consistency, of, consistency of judgment that we gain from what he called the delicacy of taste gives us control over our pleasures. While at the same time, Hume warns us against the fluctuating and inconstant delicacy of passion that makes us dependent on external sources of pleasure. So taste gives us autonomy, independence, and preserves us from being drawn in to the pleasures of the world and becoming vulnerable to seduction by those pleasures. Jeremy Bentham, on the other hand, was a thinker of the bourgeois era who saw that if the bourgeoisie sought to solve their ethical problems by aesthetic means, through the employment of distinctions between good and bad taste, new ethical problems would be created as a result. For Bentham, questions of taste and the social world of art were to be considered within the framework of the social organization of pleasure. Here it is useful to refer to J.S. Mill's opposition to Bentham on the subject of distinctions of taste, as reflected in Mill's essay on utilitarianism of 1863, in which he famously declares that it's better to be Socrates dissatisfied than the fool satisfied. That's better. The main reason, I think, that Mill tells us it's better to be Socrates than the fool is not because Socrates prefers different and better things to the fool, but because, this is crucial, only Socrates can evaluate whatever it is that the fool is satisfied with. The person of taste, says Mill, paradoxically gains an access to a new kind of pleasure through their own dissatisfaction. He tells us, for example, that the person of refined taste who winces at the imperfections of conducting in a concert 
realizes that there's a higher level of enjoyment that these imperfections are falling short of. Whereas the person who remains untroubled by this conducting in Mill's view can't really be said to enjoy music at all. So that's an interesting distinction, higher pleasure, access to judgment. I, recent, I used this example recently in a discussion with someone who was arguing that robots would one day learn to suffer and so become more like humans. My response was that until the robot could suffer like a person of taste and wince at the conducting in a concert, it would still be, in, in Mill's terms, a second class of citizen. Jeremy Bentham took the opposite position to Mill, which is why Mill argued with him. Bentham argued that separating the pleasures of taste from the pleasures of the world turned what had previously been a source of pleasure and amusement for oneself or someone else into a source of ridicule and contempt. It's also important to note that Bentham also pointed out that although the person who doesn't wince at the, at the concert has actually done the person of taste no harm whatsoever, for this very reason, there are no limits to the ridicule and contempt they might have to endure. You didn't think. Really? What kind of person are you? So if we choose to look at taste from the point of view of the social organization of pleasure, then good taste can be defined as a special form of pleasure, a pleasure in the consistency of judgment that's obtained from the impartial evaluation of our responses to objects. Even if that only attains the minimal impartiality and self-reflection of recognizing a guilty pleasure. The rather silly phrase, guilty pleasure, is used to describe a situation in which we find ourselves enjoying a film, TV program, or piece of music we think others do not hold in high regard. But guilty pleasure, properly speaking, is not the pleasure of slumming it or letting yourself go. It's the pleasure we take in our power to differentiate between a single moment of abandonment and the constant beat of our self-control. The self-control is what dominates guilty pleasure, just that moment when I let go. But normally, I'm in control. Distinctions of taste do not simply maintain social hierarchy because everyone consumes differently according to their embodied attitudes and dispositions. Rather, the bourgeois revolution in taste transforms social hierarchy by elevating the pleasures of taste as the route to social and cultural order, while pathologizing the pleasures of the world as a recipe for chaos. Judgments of taste seem to provide evidence of an ability to develop autonomy and self-determination within the world of goods, whereas accidents of noble birth and the vagaries of possession offered no such guarantee. If the, if the aristocracy conferred value on objects merely by possessing them, distinctions between good and bad taste as a new scale of value in the world of goods taught the middle classes to value their responses to objects more highly than the possession of them. So, in locating the narrative of the art school within this narrative of the bourgeois revolution in taste, the first thing to say is that state-funded art education is linked to social distinctions of taste by the manner in which distinctions of taste emerge in the context of the transition to modern market-led society. In an article published in Studio International in 1970, Norbert Linton, who at that time was head of the Department of Art History at Chelsea School of Art, declared that, quote Linton, the existence of any sort of state-funded art education is a very remarkable thing. It proves the survival of a superstition that came in with industrialization, a desire for some sort of insurance policy against the end of civilization. So if you want to know why you're working in an art school, you're an insurance policy against the end of civilization. <laughs> there are a couple of interesting things to note about this statement. The first is that I think it makes for good history, because Linton locates the origins of the state-funded art school with industrialization and capital, rather than a general history of art, or a simple narrative of art education stretching from the economies of the Renaissance to 1970. The government school of design that opened in Somerset House was distinguished not by the special qualities of art, but rather by the way that the term design, school of design, was used to frame an aesthetic response to the logic of commerce and capital. This set the school of design apart from both academies of art and traditional universities. I think this is what we have to note about the art school. It's not an academy of art, it's not a university, it's a school of capital. I think this is, this is where we come from, and this is what I argued in the book uh, that's being referred to. So eventually, in 1837, the School of Design, whose mission is the government regulation of public taste, becomes a radically different institution from an academy, sorry, I said that, 
The origins of state-funded art school form part of the bourgeois revolution of taste. Bentham's counter-arguments against Addison and Hume are also part of that history. And they offer some lessons to those of us working in art and design education in 2018 who are seeking new ways to talk about taste, or good ways, perhaps, to stop talking about it. The first part of this lecture draws attention to the manner in which distinctions of taste are not so much about the social value of our preferences, but are instead concerned with affirming the social and ethical value of impartial judgment. The second part of this lecture looks at how impartiality is enforced as a way of preventing bad choices, but also why impartiality itself may be exactly the wrong choice. The politicization of the distinction between the School of Design and the Royal Academy of Arts in the 1830s tells us something about the relationship of taste and the fine arts in commercial society. As Giorgio Agamben has pointed out, the increasing importance of the person of taste in commercial society, according to Agamben, does not correspond, as we might have expected, to the spirit's more receptive attitude towards art, or even to an increased interest in art. This is also why we need to understand the person of taste rather differently from the connoisseur of art. If the connoisseur is someone who trains themselves to recognize the particular, particular qualities of an object of art, the person of taste, in contrast, is someone who uses objects of art to train their powers of discrimination. In other words, the locus of value shifts from the object of art, connoisseurship, to the spectator of art, taste. What is valued is the spectator. The spectator, as it were, values themselves, and then other people value the spectator. It's different from finding value in the object. At the same time, however, despite this split between taste and art, it's possible to describe, um, sorry, uh, at the same time, it's possible to describe a marginal history of art, which artists have responded to the non-concurrence of art and taste. In this lecture, I'm going to discuss two artists who have engaged with taste as a subject for their art. The first artist, William Hogarth, who in fact established an Academy of Art in St. Martin's Lane in 1735, and who had set out a thesis on public taste in his print, The Bad Taste of the Town, in 1723. I'll talk about this in more detail in a bit. Hogarth gained personal advantages from a new emphasis on aesthetic solutions to moral problems in commercial society in a way that later in his career put him at odds with Joshua Reynolds' allegiance to an, an ideal history of art that was enshrined in the mission of the Royal Academy of Arts. The second artist, Grayson Perry, who is Chancellor of UAL, gives us an insight into the problems and opportunities for an analysis of taste within the legacy of state-funded art education. Perry is a contemporary artist who, I would say, deliberately chooses to work with the fact that social distinctions of taste expressed as a set of responses to his objects that are inscribed as speech bubbles on those objects do not concur with the history of art which he also uses as a resource. I think there's almost like a, a deliberate distinction between these two sets of sources. I will focus on Grace and Perry's pot, Taste of Democracy from 2005, which displays soundbite reactions to his Tony Prize winning 2003. Now when Perry delivered his, the first of four read lectures for the BBC in 2013 with the title, Democracy Has Bad Taste. Arts practitioners were given a new kind of forum in debates on taste. More recently, staff at UAL have hosted the conference Taste After Bourdieu at Chelsea and initiated the exhibition, The Vulgar Fashion Redefined at the Barbican. The Taste After Bourdieu conference was a starting point for our forthcoming book, The Persistence of Taste. The aim of this book is to offer an interdis interdisciplinary analysis of taste in the wake of Pierre Bourdieu's sociology of taste. It unites artists and art educators with curators, sociologists, art theorists, art historians, design historians, and cultural historians for the first time. Now, hosting this conference at the University of the Arts raised an important question regarding the analysis of taste. Namely, how do 20th century models of for the analysis of taste, particularly Bourdieu's, which were built in on debates in sociology, anthropology, and aesthetic philosophy. How do they hold up in the 21st century at a point when questions of taste are both widely dismissed as irrelevant, anachronistic, and yet are proving hard to eradicate from public discourse? At present, taste is in the odd position of being consigned to history by leaders of cultural institutions, while being acknowledged as an unwelcome but persistent spectre of social value. And I'll give you an example. That. This was an interview with Dayan Sujic, uh, co-director of the Design Museum in 2017. 
And Sujik advocated the separation of the activity of design from judgments of taste as a curatorial policy. He said, there was an exhibition in the early days of the museum at the Boiler House, which should be one word, which was called Taste, and Stephen Bailey, that's the Guardian's fault, it should be Bailey with a Y. The then director thought it would be a good idea to put things he approved of on easels and things he didn't like on dustbins. You may know this exhibition. You can't run a museum containing only things you like. Design is not an object or a thing. Design is not taste, so there, there you know. Now Sujit hopes, I think, that you can focus our attention on design as a social activity, rather than design as an object or a thing. If you can do that, then the practice of taste, which is based on the evaluation of our, of our responses to objects, will disappear from the museum. Nonetheless, despite this text, the displays in the Design Museum in 2017 have included one devoted to choice and taste. You see, it won't go away. Which has guided visitors to think about the difference between choices that, on the <coughs> one hand, quote, display, are heavily influenced by practical considerations, such as how well a product performs a function or sell you for money, and on the other, choices that are, quote, a matter of personal taste, with users opting for a favoured colour, material, or style. So I think the, this attempt to get rid of or you know, contain taste comes down to saying it's just personal. It's just you, what you prefer. You might like this color or that color. It seems to me this display is making a valiant effort to re describe taste as personal. The ghostly figure behind these sinful preferences is the person of taste, the so-called cultured and discriminating person who doesn't simply prefer one object to another or like one thing or another but instead shows a stubborn preference for their own ability to evaluate, evaluate their responses to objects. If we're looking, looking for the exit from taste, which is what Sujik is doing, this is the problem we're currently facing. Where is the exit? Sujik's trying to find it. Where is it? If we're looking for the exit, I think what we have to do is look at why this preference for the ability to evaluate the responses to objects is so stubborn. I don't think you can sideline it. I think you've got to face, face it head on. As David Hume put it in his essay on the delicacy of taste and passion of 1742, a person of discrimination and delicate sentiment is more happy by what pleases his taste than by what gratifies his, gratifies his appetites and receives more enjoyment from a poem or a piece of reasoning than the most expensive luxury can afford. Here Hume also draws our attention to the importance of a basic distinction between what pleases our taste, pleasures of taste, and what gratifies our appetites. In other words, again, my distinction between the pleasures of taste and the pleasures of the world. Hume tells us that the, the practice of taste is what can give us power over our preferences, and without it, we will very quickly start making bad choices in life. This, I think, is the real bourgeois, bourgeois revolution in taste, the point at which the fixed social hierarchies occupied by the aristocracy and the poor are replaced by an aestheticized form of social mobility which the evaluation of our responses to objects is accorded higher status than the ownership of them. To my mind, this bourgeois revolution in taste is what is left out of Pierre Bourdieu's sociological analysis of taste. For Bourdieu, taste is a set of cultural hierarchies that delimit the characteristics and possibilities of consumption. Uh, in Bourdieu's view, distinctions of taste uh, appear because the grand bourgeois consumes differently from the university teacher, who consumes differently from the nurse and the executive, because they have a different habitus, they consume differently, and therefore they're all in this hierarchy. For Hume, on the other hand, taste, which was the business of those in what he called the middle station of life, offers the possibility of a social power which is enacted through ordinary consumption, it happens in ordinary consumption, but in which social status accrues to a cultural and aesthetic distinction between taste and the world. Hume argues that as we wander through the world of goods, we can't pretend that our happiness does not depend in some way on all, all this world of goods. We're not monks in a monastery or gurus on a mountain in Tibet. On the other hand, we don't, as Hume says, want our happiness to depend on these objects. We don't want to make ourselves vulnerable by becoming dependent. So how do we walk this time through? Well, we become gratified by what pleases our taste. Uh, Hume's answer is that we signal we're not dependent, dependent on these objects by making our choices. Some objects, rather than others, say something good about us. In this way, taste and discrimination make us the guarantors of our own happiness. Hume's view that pleasure, the pleasures of taste provide us with personal autonomy 
consistency of judgment and social orientation gives us some insight into why we might still want to exhibit a stubborn preference for the pleasures of taste. However, I think we have to look elsewhere in Hume for an insight into how taste guarantees an ethical movement across social space. In his treatise on human nature, Hume offers the observation that if I hate my enemy, but nonetheless admire the fine quality of his voice, that gives me some assurance that the rest of you will also find that voice to be a fine quality. It's about impartiality, you see. This method of evaluation, Hume argues, is quite different from the careless use of the language of taste. Hume says language of taste is full of empty terms like elegance, which mean nothing. Uh, but if we can make the transition from the careless use of a language of taste to the careful use of a practice of taste, then the pleasure I take in my enemy's singing voice becomes the kind of information that I can use to produce a social orientation for myself as the kind of person who can test out the range of pleasant and unpleasant, unpleasant sensations to arrive at a discriminatory judgment. So that's how Hume's taste mechanism works. This question of impartial judgment brings us closer to where distinctions of taste begin to take on meaning in the social field. By enforcing a social practice of impartiality, distinctions of taste don't so much provide an aesthetic of politics as aestheticize a social ideal of the apolitical, in which the route to certainty and community of understanding is only available through impartiality. But as we have seen, impartiality also enforces this distinction between the pleasures of taste and the pleasures of the world. In the second part of this lecture, I'm going to focus on this question of impartiality and the apolitical in a discussion of Joseph Addison and Richard Steele's role in laying the tracks of the bourgeois revolution in The Spectator between 1711 and 1714. Addison's wish to develop the arts in conformity with what he called the general sense and taste of mankind is also a means to put in place a social hierarchy in which the apolitical pleasures of taste as an idealized vision of social agency are valued over and above both political factionalism and the sectarian character of the arts. So Edison put taste above art and above politics. Following this discussion, I will show how William Hogarth, who has been described as an Addisonian, Addisonian artist, constructed a first sketch of the bourgeois revolution in taste, and how Grayson Perry was worked with the legacy of that revolution in his piece, Taste and Democracy. I will then briefly introduce Bentham's attack on Edison and its contrasting regard for Hogarth. There's a paradox there. Bentham doesn't like Edison, but he does like Hogarth. If Hogarth's reading of Edison gives us a relationship between art and taste that enforces the distinction between taste and the world, the manner in which Bentham understands the ethics of Hogarth and Edison in completely different ways suggests that the moral order of art could achieve independence from the moral, moral order of taste. Bentham shows us where an exit from taste might be located, I think Sujik's trying to find it, but then I think can show where it could be located in a way that can help us tell the difference between the manner in which distinctions of taste become manifest in preferences, which is where we usually look at it, we say it's all about preferences, but we don't see is the impartiality through which these distinctions become enforced. Right, next bit second half of the lecture. It's important to note that we can locate the historical origins of distinctions between good and bad taste. As the design historian Penny Spark has noted, taste is only joined by the epithets good and bad during the bourgeois revolution. The early phase of this revolution is characterized by which to develop the arts in conformity with, conformity with what Joseph Addison, in essays for the spectator between 1711 and 1714 called general sense and taste of mankind. What is distinctive about Edison's position is that on the one hand it unites all mankind on the ground of ordinary perception and on the other hand it divides mankind into our old friend taste versus the world. It also gives a very particular social role to the arts. For Edison his new conception of taste in general could be used to oppose sectarian rules of art. In his words, music, architecture and painting, as well as poetry and oratory, are to deduce their laws and rules from the general sense and taste of mankind, and not for the principles of those arts themselves. Or in other words, the taste is to conform to the art 
uh, is not to conform to the art, but the art to the taste. So there you are, you've been told. Artists conform to taste. In the 17th century, writers like Jean de la, Jean de la Bruyere gave some latitude to the spectator to decide, rightly or wrongly, at what point an object of art has attained perfection. In The Spectator in the early 18th century, Addison and his collaborator Richard Steele gave the spectator much more power and took another leap forward and used the, used the eidolon of Mr. Spectator as the personification of the general sense and taste of mankind. If any of you have seen or read The Spectator, you'll find that Mr. Spectator keeps cropping up and giving his opinion on things. Mr. Spectator is the, is the powerful man at the centre of events. He, he is annoyed by French operas, he can't understand, he's bothered by this, he, he's you know, uh, cross about that, and he, he's, he's the centre of culture. Uh, the general sense and taste of mankind, rather than employing the violence of party political difference, employed violence in a different way, by seeking to enforce neutrality and impartiality of vision as the founding principle of cultural agency. Addison even provided a manifesto for this apolitical party of the general sense and taste of mankind. Um, <laughs> so this is rather long, but I'll read it now. This is the manifesto of impartiality. We whose names are hereunto subscribed do solemnly, solemnly declare that we do in our consciences believe two and two make four, and that we shall not judge any man whatsoever to be our enemy who endeavours to persuade us to the contrary. We are likewise ready to maintain, with the hazard of all that is near and dear to us, that six is less than seven in all times and places, and that ten will not be more three years hence than it is at present. We do also firmly declare that it is our resolution, as long as we live, to call black black and white white, and we shall call upon all occasions, we shall upon all occasions oppose such persons that upon any day of the year shall call black white or white black with the utmost peril of our lives and fortunes. So this is the plain, plain Englishman laying it down, black is, black is black and white is white, and why are you bothering with saying anything else? Good taste would triumph, Edison thought, if public taste stopped bound to the arbitrary rules of art, and art started accommodating itself to the rationale that enables everyone to call black, black, and white, white. This sets up an opposition between a true perception of things as they really are, apparently, and a false perception brought about by a fixation on the rules of art. It also means that true perception becomes a new means to establish social standards of taste. Despite Addison's seemingly populist emphasis on ordinary perception, what he advocated was a replacement of an older social distinction between those who knew the rules of art and those who did not with a new distinction. This new social distinction was between the cultural choices of those who were actively sharpening their ordinary perception and learning how to evaluate their responses to the arts and those who were passively content with all that what Addison called was childish and absurd in the arts. So again, you're either actively developing your ordinary ear and your ordinary eye to achieve this, or you're passively content and led by uh, everything that's childish and absurd and, and fanciful in the arts. Distinctions between good, and ta good taste and bad taste set their own aesthetic rules, which therefore give a particular social role to the arts as the vehicles of a refined sensibility. The new role of the arts is to make this happen. Um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau has left us an account of how taste literally crowds out art when he described the reaction of the spectators at a play by Moliere. Quote Rousseau, I never attend a presentation of the comedy of Moliere without admiring the delicacy of the spectators. A word that is a little loose, an expression that is coarse rather than obscene, everything wounds their chaste ears. <coughs> It's important to note here the spectators run the show because the coarseness of Moliere is defined not by the playwright himself but by the judgment of his audience that he's failed to make his work agreeable to them. The spectator again is the centre. A different and contemporary perspective on the relationship of taste and art is provided in an excellent analysis by the sociologist Dirk von Lem, von Lem of two museum visitors in front of a painting in our forthcoming book persistence of taste. Uh, von Lenz's chapter on these two museum visitors appears in a section of the book on taste and museum edited by Michael Lennon, who is sitting there. Von Lenz offers a close analysis of the dialogue of two people standing in front of this painting by Rembrandt. 
What is notice noticeable about this analysis, I think, is how the assessments of the painting that the two people are standing in front of are being used by them to establish a social relationship with each other. On the one hand, the museum offers a safe space in which the pleasures of, pleasures of taste, which are based on the evaluation of our responses to objects, can be separated from the less discriminating pleasures of the, pleasures of the outside world. On the other hand, what is evident in von Lem's account is that the evaluation of responses to the Rembrandt portrait, which at one point veers off into a discussion of Vermeer and the girl with the pearl earring, can take place, play, can take place in the space of the general sense and taste of mankind without having to be concerned with any work of art in particular. You can still be in taste while in fact saying nothing uh, reasonable or interesting or uh, perceptive about art at all. The status of the museum as a place where the pleasures of taste are pursued does not diminish the potential for those outside the museum to enforce distinctions between the pleasures of, pleasures of taste and the pleasures of the world. For an example of this, I'd like you to refer you to the following question. How much can we really rely on someone who loves the doors? <laughs> I tested this on Twitter uh, a few weeks ago, and it got a really interesting response. <laughs> Some people say, you can't trust anyone who wants to do it. <laughs> this question appeared in a review by Patricia Lockwood, published in January 2018, of a documentary film about the writer Joan Didion, directed by her nephew Griffin Dunn. So the implication is Joan Didion loved the doors. Can she be trusted? It's a question which takes us straight to the heart of distinction between good taste and bad taste, which parts the quality and the social status of our responses to objects. With this question, Lockwood raises an issue concerning Joan Didion's ability to evaluate her own responses, which, is, which it seems may have been impaired by her indiscriminate love of the doors. The question then is, can we really rely on someone who is blinded by their passions and can't tell the difference between loving something and evaluating it? If Joan Didion, Didion can't organise her own preferences, what does that say about us if we express a preference for Joan Didion? In Lockwood's review, this spiral of cultural doubt and suspicion, what she calls the three in the morning question, is laid to rest. She decides at the end of her review that Joan Didion's writing, quote, can be leaned against like John Wayne. So in the end, her quality wins through. On the basis of what we read, we have to assume that this certainty about Didion's quality does not issue from Lockwood's blind love of Didion, but rather from the consistency provided by a critical evaluation of her work. Discovering reasons why Didion might not be relied upon, or she might have been led astray by Jim Morrison, is what demonstrates the crucial social distinction <coughs> between evaluating something and loving it. Here we have love, not evaluation. Addison's idol on Mr. Spectator is still at work here, because impartiality is what people ought to strive for, and the seductive, seductive qualities of the object are what you should resist. This means that after all this Pan-American and cross-cultural shenanigans with Joan Didion, Jim Morrison and John Wayne, we can nonetheless say we've been offered a judgment of taste here, which could be phrased as, reading Joan Didion is for those who can learn to prioritise the pleasures of taste, while listening to the doors is for those who are content with the simple pleasures of the world. Now, a judgment that advises me to choose Joan Didion and avoid Jim Morrison is of course perfectly useless, but it shows us how to find aesthetic support for the social and ethical value of an impartial judgment, which can protect us apparently from bad choices. It's important to note the gulf that separates this essentially bourgeois judgment of taste, which draws on the valorization of an ethically safeguarded motion, motion across social space, from an aristocratic taste and personal choice. It's difficult to find aristocratic uh, uh, judgments of taste these days, but I found one. For an example of the latter, Look to the famous and acerbic comment about Michael Heseltine, made by Sir Michael Jopling, that the trouble with Heseltine was that he had to buy his own furniture. <laughs> this, of course, is a joke made by a peer of the realm at the expense of the socially mobile, and good taste and bad taste <coughs> doesn't come into it. You either had to buy your own furniture or you didn't. It's about possession, and possession adds value. Whereas for bourgeoisie, possession doesn't add any value, but that important distinction between loving the doors and judging Joan Didion really matters. Now, I'm going to move on uh, now to William Hogarth and Grace and Perry. It seems beyond argument 
uh, I mean, going back to the art school here now, he seems to be on the argument that Hogarth's enterprise was Addisonian, in that his moral theories implicitly advocate the middle way between vice and virtue. This is a quote by David Bindman in his book Hogarth and His Times Serious Comedy. So Bindman is saying, Hogarth is an Addisonian artist, look at what he did. Other Hogarth scholars, such as Ronald Paulson and David Salkin, have given support to this idea of Hogarth as an Addisonian artist. Mr. Spectator actually makes an appearance. Let me go back to this one to uh, go back here. Mr. Spectator actually is in the painting here because uh, this is Hogarth's painting of the Edward ha Edwards Hamilton family of 1734. At the request of his patron, Mary Edwards, Hogarth painted her, and that's the detail, um, holding the spectator number 580 of August the 1st, 1714, in which Addison discusses the omnipresence of the deity. So Addison's in the picture, folks. Uh, now, spectator number 22 of March 26, 1711, which condemns the false taste of the town, may have been one of the sources for Hogarth's early print of the bad taste of the town here uh, of 1723. And this is where the, I think this is where I, I, I relate this in a sense to the state funded art school, because what Hogarth is saying is the Academy of Arts, spelled wrongly up there with two C's, uh, which is modeled on Burlington House, the home of Richard Boyle, third in Burlington, is in Hogarth's view, failing to stem the tide of bad taste. The, the arts have retreated from the public sphere, which is being overrun by bad taste. And uh, you know, there's no sense in which the academy or the institutions of art are intervening where they should be intervening. So there's a felt need for institutions that enter the public sphere and engage with this question of taste. This fantasy academy, whose doors are firmly shut, is shown to be failing to stem the general decay of public taste. Uh, in the form of crowds being led towards the facile and shallow amusements of masquerades and Italian operas. In the middle there, uh, the image, plays written by English dramatists such as Shakespeare, Congreve, Dryden, and of course Addison, he's there again, are being carted off in a wheelbarrow to be sold as waste paper. So Addison gets in twice. So great English playwrights being thrown away and fancy French operas being touted about hither and thither. Here, Hogarth stays true to Addison's injunction that taste is not to conform to the art, but the art to the taste, and the viewpoint of Mr. Spectator that separates the true pleasures of impartial vision from the false pleasures of the world. Now, Grayson Perry. Grayson Perry, I think, does not show us how to find aesthetic support for the social and ethical value of an impartial judgment, but rather shows us how such judgments split the social field and divide the, artist, divide the artist from his audience. Taste in Democracy, a glazed ceramic pot made by Grayson Perry in 2004, depicts characters with speech bubbles who offer sound bite reactions to Perry's Turner Prize win in 2003, including, for example, one bubble with the words, he's a serious artist and a lovable character, spoken by a woman pushing a pram. The source of this statement wasn't from somebody pushing a pram, it was a, actually a question put to Perry uh, by a journalist following the Turner Prize win. Are you a serious artist or a lovable character? In response, so in this case, public discourse has been trapped like a genie in a glazed ceramic pot. Any response to Perry's pot would inevitably include a response to these same responses, and so it would make you wonder how stylized your own response is going to be. If you want to criticize Perry, you might wonder if you would end up also in the pot, uh, as if you'd always find, always find a version of your daring critical challenge inscribed on its surface. These two artworks, Perry's and Hogarth's, show that it's also possible to describe what happens when artists respond to Mr. Spectator's intentions for art, or in the case of Chris and Perry, the legacy of that response. However, as I will now discuss, Jeremy Bentham's par paradoxical embrace of Hogarth on anti Edisonian principles accomplishes another kind of work by indicating the exit from distinctions of taste. Now, Jeremy Bentham loathed Joseph Addison and liked William Hogarth. He displayed Hogarth's illustrations to Samuel Butler's Hudibras on the walls of his house. We can account for this anomaly if we observe that in Bentham's discussion of Hogarth's engravings depicting the benefits of Beer Street and the evils of Gin Lane, Bentham identifies Hogarth as someone who, quote Bentham, had 
reflected more upon morals than many who give themselves out as professors of this science. <laughs> so they were saying, well, he's as good a moralist as many of professors who aim to write about morals. But I think reflecting on morals in a way that puts you on a par with professors of moral philosophy is not the same thing as solving your ethical problems by aesthetic means, which is what I think Addison was trying to do, through the employment of distinctions between good and bad taste. Bentham's view of Hogarth does not assume that a moral order, moral order of art that exists within a social organisation of pleasure and which can present an ethical choice between the good option of Beer Street and the bad option of Gin Lane. Just because you're in a social organisation of pleasure doesn't mean you're going to let morals go hang. There is a, an obvious moral choice being made here, but it's not Addisonian. Um, it's not, this isn't, uh, this choice is not within the Addisonian remit. It's important to note that Bentham's attack on Addison takes place on the term set by an Addisonian worldview in which the arts have been co-opted into a project of refinement. But his comments on Hogarth show how a counter-argument or counter-revolution is possible within the terms of an Addisonian universe. To adapt terms I used earlier, if Patricia Lockwood's problem is how much can we rely on someone who loved the doors, the problem that Bentham poses is, to use his own words, how can we choose a pure and simple amusement when, quote Bentham, to be hard to please shall be found to be advantageous. Lockwood's question, as I've said, is about how to find aesthetic and ethical justifications to support the social value of an impartial judgment, which can protect us from bad choices in music and many other things as well. Bentham's question, in contrast, is about why we tend to assume that certain choices are generally inferior when we gain a particular social advantage from making them. From top of the volume. So why do we assume things are generally inferior? Because we think it's to our advantage not to, to shun them on the volume. Bentham has to find his way out of the world built by distinctions of good taste and bad taste by reversing the logic through which this world has been built. The logic about Addisonian taste is that impartiality is the guarantee of a good choice. Bentham reasoned that good taste, rather than guaranteeing virtue or constructing an insurance policy against the end of civilization, was a source of social harm. By working against the grain of the logic of what I've called the strange apolitical politics of taste, Bentham came to the conclusion that taste and democracy are at odds with each other. They couldn't, they couldn't be reconciled. His thought suggests that we can reject the aristocratic violence involved in pointing out that someone has bought their own furniture well, without having to embrace the bourgeois violence of asking whether we can rely on someone who loved the door. I'm coming to a conclusion now. In the first part of this lecture, I drew attention to the manner in which judgments of taste can be completely useless as a guide to what to choose and what to reject within the cultural field. Would you prefer Keats or Bob Dylan? It's a meaningless question. But that can still convince us that impartiality will protect us from bad choices. The second part of this lecture suggested that the way out of taste, which Dayan Sujit was looking for, lies through the rejection of the impartial, impartial evaluation of our responses to objects through which distinctions of taste are enforced. Impartiality itself may be a bad choice. That stubborn preference for our ability to evaluate the responses to objects may itself be the thing that is leading us astray. In conclusion, I want to tell a story. It's become a bit of a design world fable, actually. It's quoted again and again. About an art school, we're back to the art school now. It's not UAL. It illustrates how good taste can be a bad choice. You may recognise this, baby. In the design of Victor Papanek's polemic design for the real world, Papanek discusses a low-tech radio receiver. I couldn't get an image of it. It was not in copyright, so I'm sorry you can't see it. Um, he discusses a low-tech radio receiver that uses a recycled tin can, transistor, earplug, wire, paraf uh, wire paraffin wax and wick designed by Papanek and George Seeger to be used in parts of the world without a good power supply and using locally sourced materials. You've got to imagine this, this can is pretty shoddy looking and it's covered in cowrie shells. People just decorated it the way, the way they want to decorate it. Papanek observed that when he discussed the design for the radio, this kind of very primitive radio, in a lecture at the Hochschule für Gestaltung in Ulm in 1966, the professors looked at the can and said, mm, Victor, why don't you paint it like gray? <laughs> Painted like grey, Victor. 
because it won't do. And he said, painting it would have been wrong. It's a moral judgment. It would have been wrong. For one thing, it would have raised the price of each unit by maybe one twentieth of a penny each. It's a very utilitarian argument. Which is a great deal of money when millions of radios are being built. Secondly, and much more importantly, I feel that I have no right to make aesthetics or good taste decisions, good taste decisions that will affect millions of people in Indonesia who are members of a different culture. If you like, this is the, the postmodern moment where we know this quite well. It's the moment when we think taint refinement becomes a problem instead of a solution. We, at that point, we wanted to get rid of taste or find a way out or you know, minimize it in some way. Uh, my point in this lecture has probably been that we're still struggling to do, to do that. Why is Dayan Sujik still, you know, half-heartedly, you know, putting on a display about taste while saying he wants to get it out of his design music? We're not finding good solutions for this problem, which Papanek uh, observed in this kind of moment when we tend to date the, the birth of the postmodern. What could be more impartial than a coat of light gray paint? What could exemplify the dangers of bad choices, shallow amusement, and kitsch more than a, more than a gaudily decorated can? Yet Papanek shows, firstly, how impartiality is enforced by the professors as a way of preventing bad choices, and secondly, why impartiality is, is itself exactly the wrong choice in this situation. Light grey is wrong. It would have been wrong. This story also asks us to reflect in what ways people who work in art schools become conscious of how decisions that are, are apparently made in the name of good art and good design, well, it's good design is like grey, we are actually, are actually being made in the name of apolitical social cultural forces and insurance policies against the end of civilization. Now the conditions that have created a requirement for the state, for the, the, the conditions that created a requirement for the state funded art school in the 1830s no longer exist. Yet writers on contemporary culture, such as Michael Bascar, have argued that, quote Bascar, we now have so much, whether it's books, songs, films, or artworks, let alone data, that we can't manage it all alone. We need an algorithmic culture. Yet we also need something more than ever, human taste. Bascar assumes that Mr. Spectator, the person of taste, is still the privileged agent of culture. The still point where everything else was Revolves. This is where I think we have changed since the 18th century. This spectator is no longer in charge. In the Edisonian universe, good cultural choices are the prophylactic against bad cultural choices. In the current universe of consumption, products can design themselves and refine their operability from user data. A pathological user who exhibits socially regressive tendencies may well be preferred, as the economic value of their data could be greater. Rather than Bascar's idea of a mutually beneficial, beneficial trade-off between the taste maker and the algorithm, in future we are likely to see an increasing asymmetry between human decisions and corporate control of the design object, which in turn will generate the need for new design interventions in the field of human decision making to plug the gaps. Uh, when Roland Barthes was writing about the Citroen, I think that car was built around taste in many ways. I don't think contemporary products are being built around taste the same way at all. Uh, I was uh, reading recently, I uh, commented a lot in the uh, chapter for Anne Massey about uh, a blog about something called the June, Int June Intelligent Oven linked to the internet. And the guy who was reviewing the oven said, well, I got the impression that I was being used by the oven to test the oven in a range of markets. <laughs> and that my personal views on uh, likes, dislikes, or opinion on the oven was, was you know, not, not the issue. This is what I mean by you know, corporate control of the object goes one way and human choices go another. Uh, in a reversal of Addison's appeal to the general sense and taste of mankind, the general management of pathology may become the cultural norm and self-management through taste might be the weird cultural exception. As a harbinger of all this, at the end of my introduction to our book, The, Pers the, the Persistence of Taste, I make the following observation, quote to me, in 2013, at a meeting of a UK parliamentary group on cultural and well-being, someone raised the possibility, the possibility that membership of the National Trust might be a better solution for depression and antidepressants. So, giving people membership of the National Trust would be cheaper than giving them antidepressants. 
If I say, if culture is prescribed, it cannot be chosen. If it cannot be chosen, there can be no taste. What this also means, of course, is that there can be no social distinction between the pleasures of taste and the pleasures of the world. That distinction no longer matters. And one benefit that will arise from this is that you can let, then listen to the doors let someone else losing their trust in you. Thank you.